welcome to BIMS TV. I'm Dr. Tierra Moore, founder and CEO of Black and Marine Science, and this is BIMS Dives Live. So y'all, I'm so excited. For the very first time, we are in person, out here in the streets, <laughs> filming BIMS Dives. We are leaving the Zoom space and really coming out and talking to our community leaders, other marine scientists, and I'm just so, so, so excited to be here today with Mr. Vince Leggett, the Admiral of the Chesapeake. <laughs> I'm also joined with our other moderator, Mr. Jermaine Beebe, the Chief Operating Officer of Black and Marine Science. Jermaine. I uh, just want to say hi, and uh, y'all asked for it, so <laughs> I, we are here in person. Uh, we come up from behind these desks <laughs> and these Zooms, and we live, so we are, let's do it, first one. Mr. Leggett, Adderall. <laughs> um, I think I, what we really want to first find out is a little bit, can you tell us, can you share with us the, your kind of your inspiration behind founding Black Sons of Chesapeake and kind of like what were some of the initial goals like you envisioned for the organization? But one thing I would say is that Black Sons of Chesapeake began as a project. It was a passion project that my dad uh, hunted and fished and he migrated from North Carolina in the 1950s looking for more opportunities. Mm -hmm. Him and my mom met at Fedville Teachers College in Fedville, North Carolina okay. in elementary education and he couldn't make money as a school teacher. His first assignment was in red clay, Georgia and people could tell every time he went to work because his car came back full of red clay above the wheels <laughs> and he told my mama uh, to pack it up we're going to the big city Baltimore yeah. because we had families there looking for opportunities but by both of my parents coming from the Carolinas my dad from the Fedville south of the border uh, Lawnburg, North Carolina, Maxton, Bennettville, South Carolina my Come mom was from Carolina. the mm -hmm. uh, Rocky Mount area <laughs> yeah. and they would ship my older brother and two sisters down the country every summer. And they called my dad, granddad, Arthur Smith, Kingfish. And he had seven sons and my mother, sister they called her, Willie Mae. Mm -hmm. And that was seven dudes he didn't have to hire. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was a tobacco farmer, he was an education leader, had a little general store. And not only did he own his own farm, but he also leased other farms. Okay. And so uh, he was big kingfish, and every summer I was little kingfish. <laughs> he had a straw hat with a green visor across the front of it, and that was an overseer or a supervisor's hat. And he was big kingfish, and I was little kingfish, and one, he had two rules. He said, one, be in the truck when he got ready, and two, don't tell your grandmother where you been. <laughs> and my grandmother was pleased because she said that Kingfish couldn't get in much trouble with little Vinny. What she didn't know is he dropped me by the pool hall, gave me a quarter, gave the boys a quarter, where they could get some nabs and a Yoo-Hoo soda, and came back and picked me up three hours later, and I never ratted him out. <laughs> and so I would just say at an early age, uh, he taught me how to go on a need-to-know basis. He was a leader, and uh, he was somebody that I looked up to. But what it did do for me as a kid growing up in the grit and grime of Baltimore City, I will tell you and the listening audience, getting away from the grit and grime of Baltimore was a great contrast. I knew the alleys better than I knew the streets. Uh -huh. And I hope I don't have to break that down in any further. I think most of our yeah, viewing and listening you. audience can <laughs> understand yeah, I knew the alleys better than the streets. Yeah. But going back to your question, what it did do for me was it gave me an early land-based experience. So that's one of the things I think that really got me on a different trajectory. Right, as far as like inspiring you. Guys, I got to, and I, I think for like, so a little bit as far as like the organization, when you first kind of like, you know, it came together like real organically, right? Like, did you have any kind of like initial like goals that you envisioned for? Like, you know, like, man, I, we're doing this, but I really like to, would like to achieve this, you know? Well, what I would just say is, is that academically, 
Uh, my undergraduate degree is in urban planning and community development that I received from Morgan State University. That, that's mine. Go, go Bears. <laughs> and I had a minor in political science. Mm -hmm. And what I would also say is I've never had a goal to be an A student. I've never been, and I'm not an A student today because I was not willing to do what A students do. <laughs> that I had places to go and people to see. So I was attorney general of the student court. I was vice president and president of my junior class. I had two or three internships. And so I really desired to be a well-balanced student. I also took a master's degree in public administration mm -hmm. and my specialty was educational facility planning. And I had uh, done an internship with Baltimore City Public Schools, and the deputy superintendent promised me if I finished on time, he would give me a job. And that gave me direct motivation yes. to buckle down, fly <laughs> right, get, get it done, internships, summer schools. And I was a transfer student from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And all of my friends had got economic. Uh, academically dismissed. We were leaving a suburban college campus going into the hood for lunch break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was majoring was in Pity right. Pat, Blackjack, and Peanut <laughs> Pinochle. Pity Pat fed me lunch. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, oh, hey, Pity Pat for a dollar? Oh, yes. Giddy, let's go. Yo, as soon as you told me Urban Planning, I was like, yo, that was, I don't know how I got into that degree, but that's what, that was my undergraduate degree. Okay. And a lot of the same experiences. <laughs> go shout out to FAU, go Owls. And so, we just really, you know what I mean? <laughs> shout out to Hampton. Shout them all out, right? Shout out to Hampton. But, uh, you know, the same kind of experience, you know, we used to get done. So we used to go down to the uh, Los Olas for a lot of day. We spent a lot of time there yes. trying to study. <laughs> hey, hey, look, we were doing field work then. Yeah. We, we, we had to go to, I would, I would go up on the strip. That was our Martin Luther King Boulevard. It was called Harford Road would figure out who was in charge and make myself their special assistant. Mm -hmm. I was with the top preacher, top politician, top crap shooter, top teacher, top hustler, because what my grandfather taught me was good help was hard to find. Mm -hmm. He said, Vince, be good help. Mm -hmm. And I would make myself their special assistant. This is what I would say is that the system protects good help. Subsequently, I worked for five governors. You, you've done a lot. So, so you got this title, Admiral of the Chesapeake. But yeah. listen, let's just take it back just for the streets. What is the Chesapeake? What is the Chesapeake Bay and what does it mean to you? Well, I would say I channel Frederick Douglass. Mm. And this is what Frederick Douglass say. The Chesapeake Bay is a water of hope mm -hmm. and a water of despair. Mm. And that is the dichotomy, because what he said was that his ancestors came off of the Atlantic Ocean from West Africa. More enslaved people went to South Carolina, to the Caribbean, and then they came up the Chesapeake Bay through Cape Charles and Cape Henry, Virginia. Mm. And that's where salt water comes into fresh water in the lower part of the bay. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of Hampton Roads, Newport My News. Yes. <laughs> yes, places like that, Portsmouth, mm -hmm. Virginia Beach. That mm -hmm. is the lower Chesapeake Bay. And if you were at Bibbs Week, you were in Norfolk, Virginia. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Elizabeth River, James River, yeah. right at Hampton. But then it extends 200 miles up to the Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, and that's where fresh water mm -hmm. comes in, but it starts in New York, Cooperstown, New York, where the Little League Hall of Fame in baseball is played at. But that is 64,000 square miles and the largest estuary. Mm -hmm. I know that's a fancy word, but not for you scientists, but when <laughs> I'm out at the elementary schools, uh, estuary has about six different uh, steps to it, mm -hmm. but the largest estuary in North America. Mm -hmm. And so, as Frederick Douglass said, his ancestors were in the hole of ships. But here's what Harry Tedman says. Harry Tedman says is that this Chesapeake Bay served as a gateway to freedom. Mm -hmm. 
because she used the bay and its tributaries and knowledge of tides and winds and her daddy worked on the water's edge as a timberman. Her family worked as oystermen and fishermen. And so she understood and saw black captains and black boat owners and black builders mm -hmm. uh, chasing muskrats and harvesting turtles and living on the water's edge. And she used that as a escape route to freedom. Mm -hmm. And so again, that whole dichotomy a water of hope and a water of despair. And so Douglas and Tedman had served as the bookends for blacks of the Chesapeake and just the tension in despair and hope. That's really interesting because, you know, I think a lot of people don't know this information about Harriet Tubman, mm -mm. right? Like really, because when we talked about Harriet Tubman, what do we talk about the Underground Railroad and even a lot of the uh, uh, illustrations of Harriet Tubman is always kind of her in the woods and yeah, the training lurking people through the forest, lurking through the forest, hiding out in the bushes, find, going from house to house. And then, you know, what we find out from you and some of the history in, in being here, you find out that the captains, the ships, the water, played a, in a major, major role in freeing slavery. Well, I, I think a big part of it is what we know about is more of the latter part of Frederick Douglass's life, mm -hmm. the latter part of her Tebbers' life, but not their beginnings. Right. Mm -hmm. On the Chesapeake Bay, on Maryland's eastern shore, mm -hmm. that story was never told. Mm -hmm. So we see Frederick Douglass with the white hair, the orator, <laughs> yeah. the uh, inspector general of the Postal Service, the liaison to Haiti, the Civil War, the speech making, that's the image we have. We don't see a little Freddie mm. being raised by his grandmother. We don't mm. see a Harriet Tubman and a brother and seeing her parents. Her dad was a freeman. Her mama was enslaved and her grandmother was a Golan, meaning she was from Angola. Mm. And one thing, I read a lot of slave narratives and people from Angola didn't take no mess then and they don't take no mess today. <laughs> so when you hear somebody from Gola, uh, many times I just tell people I'm from Gola and they stay it down. <laughs> don't mess with me. Back up. <laughs> oh. Well, that's, that's crazy. Uh, you know, we, I think we, when I first started, I used to hear the Admiral, the Admiral. <laughs> and you're known quite heavily as the Admiral of the Chesapeake. Can you, can you tell us a little about how did that moniker come along? Well, what I would say is, as I indicated, I've worked for five governors. Mm -hmm. And because of my background in urban planning and facility planning, and I've always uh, lived the life of a trustee baby. Mm -hmm. And people might say, well, Mr. Vincent, what's a trustee baby? <laughs> that means that you're Trump tight and you have everything you need. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, yes, I've had jobs and these jobs tolerated blacks of the Chesapeake if they didn't support it. Every now and then they would come to me and say, well, Vince, if you have as much enthusiasm for the job we're paying you for, as blacks of the Chesapeake, and I would go to meetings and say, well, hey, Vince, who you represent today, the governor, blacks of the Chesapeake, what hat you got on? And I even had a business card that said expediter. <laughs> and people wanted to know, is that T-O-R or T-E-R on the tur? And for me, it was walking between opinions because even the guard jobs I had with governors was not a suit and tie it wasn't at a conference room. It was sitting on the tailgate of a pickup truck or on the golf course or in a duck blind hunting mm -hmm. because I knew what the governor wanted. I knew what Dr. T wanted. I knew what you wanted. And they said, Vince, can you work it out? <laughs> and if you get caught behind enemy lines, we didn't send you. I said, sign me up. That's the world I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Because when the deal go down, you're not going to cover me anyway. <laughs> when it get hot, I had an older brother, and he would get the cover and roll. And you get two rolls of blanket around you. You can't pull it loose. Mm -hmm. So if it get hot, come on, T. I see, I see you working. Yeah, you was in a large family, too. Yeah. <laughs> and because when it gets hot, you're not going to cover it anyway, because any blanket you're going to take 
and Vince went rogue. I don't know why he was talking to these people. We didn't send him. Mm -hmm. And I just said, sign me up. Mm -hmm. But that's walking between opinions. And so uh, that is the work that I've done. Uh, and also along that way, I've been former president of the school board here in my county, which was the 45th largest school district in the nation. Mm -hmm. There are school systems all over America, but the 45th largest, meaning the size of the budget, the number of teachers, 119 schools, and I had the gavel. And I never lost the vote. I took the position as the chairman, I'm the tiebreaker. And so if I didn't have the winning vote, I abstained and the public went crazy. We sent you down there to vote. Uh, he is the most no voting person I've ever seen in America. I mean, if I'm not winning, I'm not voting. I'm not voting. Period. I don't do losers. No. I am not a loser. I'm not identified with losers. No. no. Because I had a contentious board. They went to rub my nose at a loss. And I'm still a little ready from East Baltimore. Don't let them see you bleed. Don't let them see you sweat. And I, if I didn't have the numbers, I didn't call the question. And the criticism didn't bother me. The ad was petty. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> but what I would say is that, uh, but look at the influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was yeah. representing the Board of Education in the Maryland State General Assembly. I was negotiating union contracts. I was in negotiating employee benefits. And I take the position whether you thought I did a good job during my five years, two years as president and vice president. I got my ticket punched as the chairman of the board, the president of the 45th largest school district in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I don't get into whether I did a good job or didn't do a good job. The only people to speak against experiences, people don't have any. Let me say that one more time. Mm, say it again. <laughs> the only people that I see that speak against experiences, people that don't have any. Mm. And what I know is I had to gavel, and until you've been in the situation, don't tell me how it is to be up all night trying to grapple with the decisions of the day if you haven't sat in the kitchen and did the, the cooking. That's a real word, for sure. And, and, and let it be said, let it be so. Oh yeah, yeah and, and you can, you all can speak to it. You all are leaders. Y'all, y'all been listen. I've spent many long nights in city council meetings. You probably like you. You want to really know what's going on in the city? You spend <laughs> you, you're up there till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, and people are still can't make heads or tails about a decision. That's when you really know, you know, if you're built for the civil service type of life. It's, it's hard. But we all know where the real work gets done. It is in those meetings when we go in the team, round the table, yes. talking about doing it. I feel like that's how BIMS <laughs> was started, and that's how we've been successful is really having these authentic conversations, talking about what's the truth, what is my experience, and guess what? No one's going to take that away from me, because as you said, if you complain about my experience, it's because you haven't had it. Yeah, right. So how can you tell me it didn't happen? Like, right. I'm telling you, this just happened. It just, this just occurred. So until we, that's why we use this storytelling to talk about it. Now I'm a blasted all in face. Oh, it didn't happen. I'm telling everybody it happened. I'm putting it over here that it happened. I'm making shirts that it happened. I'm putting it on TikTok that it happened because you can't deny my experience because you didn't have it. Right. And that's just the truth. And I think it goes back to the early beginnings of Blacks of the Chesapeake that our first book was in 1997 because I take the position that teachers can't teach what they don't know. Mm. And I can sit around complaining about the man, complaining about the system, or I could get the step in and get the writing. Okay. So we began to write about blacks of the Chesapeake mm -hmm. and develop curriculum guides around blacks of the Chesapeake and had them approved as supplemental material of instruction. Mm -hmm. I'm a K-16 educator. I have worked at urban, suburban, rural schools, worked as a college professor, counselor, campus planner. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to give teachers material to help them teach more about black life on the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. 
And so even when we would go to book festivals and book shows, and it might be a, a thousand titles on the banquet floor, I was in a section called Educational Materials of Instruction. I was out in the general traffic mm -hmm. with 999 other titles because I had a book and a curriculum guide that was approved for use in schools along the Chesapeake Bay as supplemental materials in education, science, environment, and culture. We did documentary films, artwork, and we were like the Vegematic. You guys might be too young for the Vegematic. But it used to come on TV. Well, it, it, it would show you a machine that gave you uh, 28 different ways to chop up a carrot. Oh. So that's, that's what the Vegematic was. And by both of my parents being trained in elementary education in the 1940s, coming out of enslavement, coming out of the South, that they had to meet the student where they were, not where they think they should be. Mm. Because their schools only went up to sixth grade. Right. And they weren't getting 180 days of school, and they were getting 90 days, because first they had to plant the crop. Right. And then the man said, clear the jails out, clear the schools out, because we need to get this cotton in by Monday. Right. Oh, so no, our school really. year was 60 days. Wait, so you wait, wait, wait. Okay, I wait. wait. Yeah, hold on. Put, put a pin on it. Why they back? So they would stop the school so you could go, who? You you was doing this? My parents, yeah. my elders, my ancestors, oh, yes. Oh my goodness, really? Yes. So you gotta stop learning, go in and pick up this cotton. And go pick the cotton. And go by the jail and get Bobo out too, because he's a good cotton picker. Go, go yeah. get him too. Uh, and I want him out by Monday. So even after he was allowed to start going to school, it still was... That was not the priority. Okay. That's right. Yes. And so when I work with people like you all, I consider you all master teachers because you all understand it's not where you think the public is, the student is. You have to have a toolkit that can meet the person where they are. Mm -hmm. For sure. And that's what a master teacher is. What do you have in your toolkit? How many arrows are in your quiver to meet the student where you are? I mean, first of all, I really appreciate it because one of the, you just get some free game here uh, a little moment ago with how you position yourself as an author. You got so many right. people out here, you know, especially, you know, some of you the black peoples who are um, looking to, you know, be authors, you know, Put, you know, pinning some great, great, you know, product out there. And I think um, that was some really great game as far as like, you know, they may have not be thinking about as far as like how to position themselves to stand out um, um, better. And so that was really excellent as far as like being able to think about that and say, hey, you know, I'm not just, I went to hear all the other thousands of book writers. I have instructions, I have a curriculum. And so I am in a particular lane that is not clogged. <laughs> and, <laughs> right? and school districts pay sticker price. Mm. Right. That Long the state day. of New York, North Carolina, Texas buy for the whole district. I live in Maryland and it's 24 counties in Baltimore City. I had to go to every 24 jurisdictions and say, I'm, hi, I'm Mr. Leggett. This oh, is wow. my book. This is my curriculum. Can you review it? And they looked at one page, and the old waterman had a cigar out the side of his mouth. They said, Vince, kill the cigar, and we'll take your book. I killed the cigar, because that's what curriculum review committees do. <laughs> or is that a soda bottle, or is that a beer can? Vince killed the beer can. So I air brushed the beer can out of the picture, because this is going to fourth graders. Absolutely. So you have to be of a mindset that you can work with the system or you could fall on your sword, know my granddaddy smoked a cigar, and know it, we want no. the cigar in his mouth, and your book is not gonna be approved for use. Cause I'm big on the product development, and okay. that, that, you know what that kind of brings you back to is that um, oftentimes we'll create a product that we think mm. people want, right? Okay. It, as, instead of like focusing on what the people want. So you notice a lot of times with BIMS, we're really heavy on feedback. 
it's mm. not necessarily about like, hey, what we want to put out, mm -hmm. but what is it that they're actually looking for? And a lot of times people aren't successful because they don't realize like what they actually, I, I want to write my book and my biography. Well, that's great. Well, probably, people may not want to read it. They may not want to read it. I, I had an event <laughs> and the band told me, I said, guys, your music is not popping. Well, Mr. Leggett, <laughs> that uh, we plan what we practice. I say, well, play something you didn't practice. Because, <laughs> because, your whole set, please. <laughs> right, you got a playlist, <laughs> and people ain't even getting up on electric slide. So, 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 well, so, let alone the booty call of the Cuban shuffle. <laughs> <Exactly. somewhere. laughs> <Exactly. laughs> exactly. Where are they gonna go with that? <laughs> <laughs> but this party is really over, Dr. T. This is <laughs> well, play something you didn't practice. <laughs> but people get the e egos in there mm -hmm. that I'm the DJ, this is the playlist, it worked last week. No. But uh, it has to be stakeholder driven, and that's what I well, like about you, BIMS. Exactly. And this is what attracted me to the BIMS family mm -hmm. is stakeholder driven. It's not because what we like. We're trying to meet a need because if you don't have stakeholders that raise their hand and say, BIMS is making a difference in my life. Blacks of the Chesapeake is making a difference in my life. Yes, that's right. Those are the people I want to go to the hearing, to go to the city council, to go mm -hmm. to the legislature, not self-serving. We could go there. Sure. Now, we need real people that we move the needle for at the hearing. Exactly. Because I love talking about BIMS, but it is great to have someone say like, wow, I am so glad I did this program, or I did BIMS Swims, now I can swim, or I, now I can scuba dive, now I can, now I know about EDMA, now I know about all these things because you all came here and spent this time and was intentional. Yes. Intentional. Gosh, you, you, you really kind of get, took us back through your history, and one thing I've noticed is that You've walked in a lot of different roles, wear a lot of different hats. And so you've been doing this for a minute, and I think one of the things I always kind of wonder about people, when you, when you sit back in some of your moments, and all the things that you've done and you've experienced, this might be a little controversial, but you, you know, you, you, you're you safe to, to, to run here. <laughs> this well, is we, a safe space. It's a safe space. <laughs> we truly want to know, like, you know, tell us about some of uh, your real key memorable moments out here. Mm. Well, some of my key memorable moments are uh, I outlived much of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> I beat out the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You've been to have every line. You've been to have every line. That's why we ask the question. You don't talk about how you know. You've been to have every line. All these permissions. We don't know what you do. You literally know. Hey, listen. You get caught. We don't know you. We're going to all do this dirt. Yeah. It's going to be on the shirt. Please be prepared. It's coming. I'm trying to hear some of these out stories. Like, what you so, and feel free to call them out specifically. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm the last man standing. So I, and the man that win the war write the history. Yeah. The man that win the war write the history. Mm -hmm. And I've been the CEO of two multi-million dollar housing agencies. Mm -hmm. And on one of my assignments, the people say, this is when I was president of the school board and running a public housing agency. Mm -hmm. Hood Housing and Urban Development said, time out, Vince is good, but he ain't that good. Pick today. Because the next time we call down and hear the house that thought is on fire and you had a school board meeting, he is going to roll. It's going to be blood in the street. Mm. So they called a time out, brought all the power players together, put me in the room and said, Vince, pick. The housing authority paid me Eighty and ninety thousand dollars a year, and this was in '87. Oh, that's good money. In '87, that was great money, yeah. and, and, a, and, and a car came with it. Uh oh, yeah, yeah. it was bully. Yes, and the school board was free. Mm -hmm. I said, "Give me the school board," mm -hmm. and then they said, "Well, report to the roof." <laughs> <laughs> Because T-Recabbers is waiting out front for the meeting to come over. 
to see what color smoke was going to come out of the chimney. Right. Did we have a new pope or not? <laughs> <laughs> when, when, is the, when is the sex of the baby? So everybody was looking at the roof to see what went on in this big meeting. Right. And they airlifted me to Anne Arundel Community College, and I became a campus planner that oh, day. Wow. <laughs> and my office was in the boiler room. Mm. And I said, thank you. And because now I am a campus planner at a community college, mm -hmm. I'm president of the school board, and 80% of our students go to the community college. Mm -hmm. So now I'm in a field that's congruent. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make Board of Education president and a public housing authority match. That was never going to match. Yeah, yeah. But now I'm education, education. And so when I went to the college, I asked the president, do I get a car? <laughs> <laughs> you don't even get a parking spot, sorry. Are you kidding me? So you realize you're in the, <laughs> you're like, so you realize you're in the boiler room. <laughs> <laughs> you get a car. Yeah, you're right. He said it ain't been one car and he driving it. <laughs> no. <laughs> you might get his bus back. <laughs> they said they said he ain't through yet. <laughs> he must not understand how close he came. <laughs> well enough is he get a car. <laughs> Cause the other place I'm leaving did have a car. Right. No, nah, boss, nah, that that jig is up. <laughs> and I had to look up jig, and that's an Irish term. <laughs> Meaning the little button dance is over. Mm -hmm. But again, good help. This goes back to mm. good help. And I think the other example, I was trained by a group of people into two schools of thought. One was liberation theology. Dean of this group was a gentleman, Dr. O. St. Clair Franklin, mm. who had a PhD from Yale University in 1940 in clinical psychology. Oh, wow. And he was the preacher's preacher. Preachers would come down and lay on his couch and I would tow his briefcase and he had a Bible in it and a 22 pistol. <laughs> and <laughs> You stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Because okay. his Old thing, too. yes. Everybody carrying 40. Yes. Because his thing is he'd rather for the police to catch up with it than the jitterbugs without it. Mm -hmm. okay. Because he did his work in the streets. Mm. And so his whole philosophy was looking at scripture through liberal eyes. I was trained at Morgan University by a group of uh, academic gangsters, intellectual gangsters. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I think myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you are one. Yeah. And let me tell you, you why. With that. And let me tell you why. What makes you one? I saw you. An academic gangster can make the speech and leave a white paper or a black paper with the clerk. We all done heard fancy speakers mm -hmm. in the penitentiary. <laughs> Rap all day, talk all day on the corner. Rap all day, talk all day. But can they leave? and America's brief with the, with the secretary of the court. Mm -hmm. Can they leave it with the secretary of the city council? Because your speech is ephemeral, like the smell of a new car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get in, it's smelling good for two weeks. <clears throat> then it starts smelling like us. Babies, cigarettes, popsicles, <laughs> whatever's in and out. <laughs> but once you leave the paper, when the man say, make your speech and leave 15 copies with the clerk, mm -hmm. we got 15 copies in the briefcase. Mm -hmm. Because somebody's going to come by and pick up the record one day. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Going to yes. pick up the record one day and going to graft on what you left. Right. Okay. Good. You left a remnant. Because what the word says is there's always going to be a, a reference. Somebody going to tell the story on what went down. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've all had a Red Sea experience, as husband Herod Tubman says, that Pharaoh was precedent on one side and the Red Sea was at my back. Come on, somebody help me out. <laughs> yeah. huh? I'm talking about the waters of hope and the waters yeah. of despair. Yeah, absolutely. And the scorecard read zero. Huh? Who have been there? Me. No, no, we're we're there. Take a first real quick, <laughs> Go ahead, Now I'm bad. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you
<laughs> yes, Yo. but uh, we came through. Mm. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, y'all, y'all got me excited. Yo, all right. <laughs> Where we at? See, I put DNA. these cards together. <laughs> no, because I wanted to ask before we get to eDNA, we will talk about eDNA. Okay, y'all. But you know, you talked about um, you know Harriet Tubman, and Frederick Douglass. This being the Chesapeake Bay being rooted in blackness, yes. if you will. Yes. So. When did it change? Cause um, it, to me it looks a little different. And I know you have a different lens cause you work mm -hmm. with black fishermen and women who have always worked here. But like, when did you really see that change? And then even the black beaches being no longer black beaches. What I would say is probably in the mid to late sixties and early seventies, mm -hmm. because a big part of our work is looking at leisure, recreation, and entertainment during the period of segregation. Mm -hmm. Where we had to have our own because we were denied access. We couldn't go to the park pool. Mm -hmm. We couldn't go to the library. We couldn't go to the schools. We couldn't go to the beaches. <clears throat> and so enterprising black people established their Buck Road, Bayshore Beach, Virginia mm -hmm. Beach, Sag Harbor, Idlewood, Cars Beach, Martha's Vineyard, Bruce's Beach in, in California, mm -hmm. the Lincoln Beach in New Orleans, mm -hmm. the American mm -hmm. Keys down in Miami, mm -hmm. the Amelia Island in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. We created our own spaces. Mm -hmm. Business people, business women, investing capital, and had some of the most fabulous beaches in America. And so it's always been a big debate where are we better after integration and segregation? Mm. Are we better? And what I would say is that when we had the custodian, the preacher, and the school teacher living on the same block, it gave a texture and fabric to our community. Mm -hmm. Right that we were pulling people up. No, this is how you put your tray scan out, baby. Yeah, right. right. And, and it goes out every Monday, baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or community. yeah, training community, lifting up. Mm -hmm. And uh, just seeing people from different stratas of life. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about EDNA. Okay. We have a project, Dems, Lex of Chesapeake, bringing EDNA to the streets. Let me shout out our funders, you know, pay the bills real quick. <laughs> we got thanks to the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Chesapeake Gateway, National Science Foundation. We are really able to bring this innovative technology to a whole community of people who probably would have never even known what eDNA was. But what I love the most about the project is partnering with Blacks of Chesapeake for the storytelling, for that, what they're calling now the historical ecological knowledge <laughs> that you all have, <laughs> the fancy word, historical ecological knowledge. <laughs> but that is what you've just talked about that you have been preserving and curating all of these years, that, that history that no one can take away from you. Now, can I go out dip my little thing in the water or in the sediment and see any relationship to what your history knows is true. So in your own words, tell the streets, what are we doing with this project and how you feel about it? Well, what I would say is the first thing is that when you and Dr. Camille Gaines came to me and talked about eDNA, I stepped off and asked Alexis and Siri, what is eDNA? <laughs> Never heard of stuff okay. before. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> I decide whether I liked it or wanted some or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounded like CSI kind of talk and all of this stuff here, but then once they broke it down about how they could use their scientific training and how a high percentage of all fish started in some coral reef and mm -hmm. the work out at University of Washington, Seattle and Penn State and Brandywine and UCLA and Hampton mm -hmm. University and they started explaining and every time they talked I understood better about how you can take samples, soil, core samples, sediment, sand and do analysis. I already understood how you could find an arrowhead until it went back 1,500 years, or how they went and found King Tut's tomb that went back 30,000 years. So I already intuitively knew carbon dating and how we can mm -hmm. scratch in the mud and tell stories. But then when it came to African Americans and spaces I work in, and said, well, Vince, we want you to help us 
talk about not only the place, but the people who occupied the lands. And then the light bulb went off. Mm -hmm. And then I started feeling it and seeing the magic and walking in that space. And, and when I talk about BIMS, the room gets quiet. I mean, I'm almost like an E.F. Hutton when I just say BIMS. People get, people get quiet. And when I talk about BIMS and the Blacks of the Chesapeake teamed up and National Science Foundation said, I think y'all are on to something. Mm -hmm. When the Packet Foundation said, I think y'all are on to something. When the National Park Service, Chesapeake Gateway said, I'm going to sew in and pour into your work because I think it is cataclysmic. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And that's a fancy word, cataclysmic. Mm -hmm. I want the young people to work on that word, meaning the things start firing. Mm -hmm. And that's when we shirt. fire, y'all fire. And mm -hmm. then something else fire. And then we have a mm -hmm. cataclysmic explosion of knowledge and understanding and restoration. Uh, that is the beauty, and I'm just glad I'm a part of this movement. You got me hyped by my own project. <laughs> Look. What's, what's it's prolific to say the least, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And something you were talking about earlier is that how, you know, we can include the community in this. Like, you know, we're talking about this data and we're scientists, but all of this work that I'm doing doesn't matter if the people who I'm working for don't understand it. And I think that's what a lot of scientists just don't realize. <laughs> They're doing this little work in their lab. They put out this paper that literally no one can necessarily understand the general public who they're supposed to be working to help. And so if my papers aren't readable, then I failed, to be honest, as a scientist. And I think that's why we are taking this approach of just including people from the beginning. Like, you can't actually understand a paper if maybe you were there and you were there and you understand, but then there is that storytelling aspect of actually, I can just watch this little video and see what this is about. Mm -hmm. You know, I can go on TikTok and learn about eDNA real quick in 15 seconds. So I think about just like, utilizing how we tell stories um, with scientists is just the most going to be the most impactful but then also again including the communities along in this participatory science uh, allowing them to be involved equipping them with the skills is really going to be that game changer i think what you've been very good at um you know with blast of just beacon in this partnership with bams is really being able to kind of layer that you're con helping us really connect the dots that people are going to need to connect the dots to understand the real implications of this work, right? The historical context, the context of the people here, because they're all a part of the story, right? They're all a part of this waterway. And I think, um, you know, that's such a huge and significant part. And um, I think one of the reasons that you guys made such great partners on this is like, you guys understood that, mm -hmm. right? And you guys understood exactly the type of approach we wanted to come to. And, and what those implications are, how we wanted to, uh, you know, get this out, you know, to a broader and wider audience. Well, I think one of the things that I think we all are benefiting from is even in our Blacks of the Chesapeake's local legacy collection, it's been recognized by the Library of Congress, the U.S. Congress, and the American Folklife Center out of Washington, D.C. for bringing to light a little known aspect of Americana. And I take the position the same way that 40 years ago we hadn't heard of Tuskegee Airmen or Buffalo Soldiers. And what I say is that I grew up looking at Artie Murphy and Westerns and I never saw black cowboys. It wasn't because they didn't exist, they just weren't showing them. When I looked at army pictures crying, crawling through the mud at Pork Job Hill in Hiroshima, I didn't see black sailors and navies and, 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 and red teams and red tips. And it's the same way with the men and women whose lives have been shaped by the Chesapeake Bay. And so what I'm saying is that we're elevating people that are hidden in plain sight and buried in unmarked graves sitting at the bottom of this noble Chesapeake Bay. And we're going to bring voice to those people mm -hmm. that they have stories to tell, the backstories to tell. And so to combine your scientific work I joke with you guys, I want a white lab jacket like you wear. We're going to get you one. Yes, get you one. yes, I, I want a three-quarter <laughs> left lab jacket. Wait, he said three-quarters left. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I want to come out looking yeah. like Shaft. I, yeah. I want to come down the runway looking like Shaft. I don't want one of them little uh, cocktail server jackets. Y'all get me a three-quarter left and hit the right hand. And then I'm going to put my cowboy boots on it. Then we're going to put our cowboy boots up on the desk and we're going to chop it up. And talking about what is the soup for today.
hope. and lift up spirits and give people hope. For sure. That's my vision. That's your vision. <laughs> Okay. And hopefully you see your face in the picture. Oh, yes. You know, please, I'm going to be right there and post it up. <laughs> What's up? All day. What's up? I think we are coming towards the end. And so I have a question that I had to ask. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been me if I did it. And, you know, because I would say Bims is more new school. <laughs> Y'all might be more old school. Let's talk about black versus blacks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how you feel about that because i'll be honest some people will be like blacks in marine science i'm like no it's black this is just it we're not like going with that term blacks anymore but y'all have held on to this black so the chest week so let's talk about it let's get into it because people get mad when they get the s added on sometimes well i, I would say i understand and i've been on both sides of the aisle because i've gone from colored the negro to African-American, to Afro-American, to uh, blacks, to Negroes, and black. Mm -hmm. So I have lived 70 years and I've read the historical record and we've been called it all. As I say, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> and so this is what I say is mm -hmm. that uh, so often people use those terms to help divide us. Mm. because normally there is some negative hook into which box you check. Mm -hmm. So I try to steer clear of that. I just look at it as a booby trap. Mm -hmm. And so I don't put a lot of energy in it. I know that we had a task force report in the legislature and was it African Americans in the environmental communities or community? Mm -hmm. So it's not a new story. Mm -hmm. S's make a difference. Sure. <laughs> S's make a difference mm -hmm. because to me what S's show is that there is a collaboration and it's just not a one and a two. It's a psychological movement mm -hmm. is the way I look at it. And so because even sometimes when I write it, I understand how you write it and your S is on the sciences, mm -hmm. because I guess your point is, it's multiple sciences. Mm -hmm. I guess, and you helped me out, because it looks like y'all have no S on the black, but an S on the sciences. Mm -hmm. No, it's just black, black and marine, marine science. science. So, no so I guess, but I guess that in my mind, but when I interact with you, I hear so many divisions of sciences. Right. Right. And because whenever y'all drill down and I listen more carefully, it's not one science. It's not one block of science. Because y'all think I'm asleep, but I'm really looking and listening. Mm -hmm. And I have a photographic memory, mm -hmm. except what day the trash goes out, my wife tells me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't never get that, can't get that day right. Yes. And so, but you tell me. But I do think that it's an interesting question, but maybe that's part of your people poll. I mean, mm -hmm. see what the stakeholders say. But I guess my question is, isn't it multiple divisions of science that you all represent? Do I understand that purpose? Oh, definitely. System. Yeah, marine science in itself is broad and a mm -hmm. vast field. There's like chemistry, there's physics, there's all of that. But I have heard this before. It's like we are in marine spaces, really. Okay. Like we're in marine people who are even tangential, who don't ever go into a lab, who are underwater photographers, underwater, you know, um, photographers or videographers, people who make documentaries. They are still included in our space. Now, but for me, teaming with you all, looking at place telling and people telling, that I understand we could do water samples, we could do soil samples, we could do core samples. Mm -hmm. So it might be on the water's edge, but I don't see my work limited to aquatics. Right. Right now. And no, so definitely not. And so I think as you bring on different partners, we all have to kind of find our space and find our voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so again it seems like it's a, a good question and you're asking the right questions and from stakeholders mm -hmm. because not only am I a participant, but I'm a stakeholder. Is it? Exactly. Leading the way. 
I think that's been great. Yo, thank you so, so much for coming on to the BIMS Dives live stage. First time in person. But we can't, you know, end it without you giving us at least one word of wisdom from, and, the, and, great, and, from the great BIMS list. Yes. You definitely dropped a lot of gems. Yeah, well, sure. and, and, and my marquee project is called Hands and Hearts Across the Atlantic. Mm. That... In January 2023, I went to Dakar, Senegal, mm. the door of no return, as a cultural attaché in yeah. the maritime arts. Okay, yeah. cultural attaché? Yes, know as, a, as a cultural uh, and Syrian Alexis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm currently a cultural attaché, <laughs> yeah. according to UNESCO, Education oh. Scientific Organization, yeah. and the U.S. State Department. Mm -hmm to look at boat building, sail making, harvesting, and looking at West African traditions in Chesapeake Bay through port markers, uh, historical uh, sites of memory, and so forth. And so this is a body of work since BIMS has an international footprint. Mm -hmm. My goal is to continue to have our discussions and our relationships that are international. We look forward to going to Barcelona yes. with you all. Yes. We'll and, 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 and not as a backbencher, but as a participant. Right, right. Yep. We want to be part of the wave. <laughs> So what thing is it? Hey, listen, join so the wave. At like this point, you either riding the wave or you getting washed yeah, up. So. <laughs> That's it. This is Bill Stiles, y'all. Yeah, we appreciate out. you. We out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All righty, y'all. Really hope you enjoyed this first BIMS Dodge Live in person. Make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. It's a button somewhere that you can subscribe right now. Um, then also making sure that you're following BIMS on all of our social medias. Anything else? Uh, just make sure you guys are checking us out um, at blackandmarinescience.org or BIMS.org. Uh, please make sure you subscribe. Um, and also, if you love the work that we're doing here, love our programs, make sure you guys uh, please hit the donate button on our website and support us. Uh, we're looking to grow and all this wonderful content that we're doing is all for you guys. And uh, thank you so much.